Welcome again. Right now we are on John chapter 3, verse 17, right on through to the end of the chapter. We got lots of things to cover here. This is like a smorgasbord of nuggets of spiritual gold, so to speak. So let's start here at verse 17. For God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Now, I'm going to stop here because this is a great example of how people can cherry pick scripture. What I mean by that is they take a passage here, a passage there, and they ignore everything in between. Or they take a verse here and a verse there, and they try to make that verse kind of go against everything else, okay? That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take the whole entire scope of Scripture and look at it in its entirety. Other than that, it is a half-truth. And you know that a lot of people would say a half-truth is a lie. So this is a great example of it. You read this verse, John chapter 3, verse 17. It sounds like, oh yeah, God didn't send Jesus to, to judge the world. Therefore, Jesus wouldn't judge the world at all. He just came to save the world. He just came in great love and saving the world. Now, I know a lot of, a lot of you who, uh, you know, you're listening to me right now and you're thinking, wait a second, didn't Jesus judge a lot of the people as being hypocrites, being whitewashed tombs, being sons of Satan, you know, being sons of hell and all this kind of stuff. Didn't he make lots of people angry? Well, the answer is yes, he did. And so what you got to do is you got to, you got to take it all in context. You can't just take one passage here, one passage there, one verse here, one verse there, because you make it that way. You kind of make it sound just the way you want it to sound, just the way you would like it to sound. Now, it does. If you take that verse all by itself, it does sound like God would not judge the world, that Jesus would not judge anybody, and he came to save the world. Now, most of you know that's not the truth whatsoever. You know, you read in this very book itself, the book of John, Jesus said a lot of harsh judgments. He he brought down a lot of harsh judgments against people. Individuals? Groups of people, and also, don't forget, you know, we read in the other Gospels that Jesus actually judged entire cities, okay? Condemned entire cities, okay? So let's just take take it all into context, okay? So, yes, in a general sense, just like how we spoke about John 3.16 in the previous session, it's talking about just in a very general sense. It's almost like a, a vague, a very ambiguous sense. So in the same way, John is speaking an ambiguously here when he said that God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Now, this is just a g- very vague as you know, generality, if I could use those terms, a vague generality. And I will prove it just in this chapter alone, we're going to get into things that maybe doesn't make God sound like such a very non-judgmental God, you know, a God that wouldn't judge anybody. So let's read on. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. Now, again, I got to stop here because this is just so packed full of truth. The word believes here means to actually give your life over to. It means to obey. It means to to really just dedicate yourself to somebody. If if a if a student is to actually believe in his rabbi, it means that he hangs on the rabbi's every word. Okay? Not just, oh yeah, I believe he existed. Oh yeah, I believe this happened. Oh yeah, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Oh yeah, I believe. No, no, no. If you really believe in him, it means you hang on his every word. You just totally throw yourself upon him, so to speak. Totally entrust him and entrust yourself to him. That's what it means by believing on him. Let's continue. He who doesn't believe has been judged already. Oh, that's what I was just talking about there. That just taking verse 17 saying, oh, God doesn't judge anybody. No one's going to be judged. Jesus came into the world not to judge, but to save. Well, that's just a general, vague, 
you know, ambiguous statement. You got to read it in full context to understand, yes, people are judged. And we're going to get into this more and more as we read on, not only in this chapter alone, not only in this session alone, but also in many other chapters, in many other passages of scripture. Again, let's continue. So it says, he who doesn't believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now again, this does not mean just to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the name of Jesus. You understand, in biblical times, in this context and in this culture, when you believe in someone's name, it means that you believe in everything that that person stands for. Everything about that person all of the character traits of that person. So in other words, we know that Jesus is holy. We know that Jesus is sinless. We know that Jesus is righteous. So when you say you believe in the name of Jesus, it means you believe in holiness. You believe in a righteousness. You believe in sinlessness. That's what it means when you believe in the name of Jesus. It means more than just a, you know, letters on a page. It means that you believe in the actual character of the person it's, you know, itself. So this is what we're talking about by believing in the name of Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 19. This is the judgment. Uh huh. This is the judgment. No, didn't we read just a couple of verses ago that God didn't judge anybody here? Again, let's not take this out of context as so many people do. This, it says, is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Now, this is what we're seeing even today as, as I'm recording this session here. There are a lot of big tech companies. There are a lot of big companies out there that are censoring people, okay? They are censoring people. And this is what the problem with censorship is. It keeps people in the darkness. You say, well, the stuff that they censor is, is false, you know? It's fake stuff. It's, it's stuff that's not true. Do you know how much stuff out there is not true? You know, you need to know what the truth is, yes, but you also need to know what other people are saying, even if it's not the truth. So you get a full perspective. You know how, actually, my grandmother would always say, you know, it takes all kinds to make a world. So if you censor out many kinds, you know, you don't have the full view of the full, you know, the entire world, so to speak. You need to see what's out there. You need to know what's out there. You need to know what people are saying. You need to know what people believe. You need to know what you're going to encounter. And if people are being censored, you are being kept in the dark. Okay? Not right. Okay? Why do these companies censor people? Because they love the darkness and not the light. You know, they love to keep people in the dark. They love to control things. You know, I find it very interesting that these people who censor people are the same people that are supposed to be against fascism, but these people are more fascist than, than their opponents. Let's read on. Verse 20. For everyone who does evil hates the light. Mm. Oh, what a powerful statement. For everyone who does evil hates the light. If you do evil, that automatically puts you in the category of hating the light. Once again, for everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works be, would be exposed. Who? Yeah. You know, I had a pastor once tell me several years ago that, you know, back in the olden days, oh, this pastor that was talking to me is a pastor that believes in personal prophecy, you know, a charismatic uh you know, kind of a Pentecostal charismatic kind of guy who believes in Penteco in in personal prophecies. Uh, and yet he said, out of his own mouth, he said, you know, back in the olden days, people wouldn't go to a meeting where there was a so-called prophet because uh, if you did, you would get your sins called out. So before you would go, you make sure you repent of all your sins. Make sure you got all your sins behind you before you go to the meeting. Because if you don't, you're going to be centered out. You're going to be called out. So that's exposing the darkness. Let's read on. For everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works would be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his works may be revealed that they have been done in God. After these things, Jesus came with his disciples into the land of Judea. He stayed there with them and baptized. Hmm. There's a there's a little factoid that no one talks about there. Jesus stayed with them and baptized. 
Although we know that Jesus himself, it says in another passage of Scripture, it wasn't Jesus himself that did the baptism, but his disciples did. But think about that. Here's John baptizing and Jesus baptizing at the same time. Think about how they baptized. What did they preach? You know, it says in the other Gospels they preached repentance. And that's what baptism is all about, obviously. Let's continue. Verse 23. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. They came and were baptized, for John was not yet thrown into prison. There's a good clue there. Hey, when you preach the truth, when you are preaching repentance, when you're out there doing God's work, you're not going to get a lot of people loving you, okay? You're not going to get a lot of people loving you, okay? So here John got thrown into prison. You know, a lot of you think that if anybody's in prison, that means they're a bad person. Well, not 100% of the time. Let's read on. They came to John and said, Rabbi, again, John the Baptist was a rabbi. Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he baptizes and everyone comes to him. John answered, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves testify that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore is made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, I've heard several different interpretations of this passage of he must increase, I must decrease. Well, it, John the Baptist was basically saying, hey, this is it's my time. You know, I've, I've already been in my prime, so to speak, in my ministry. It's my time to recede now. It's Jesus' time to now to come out into the fullness of the public eye. Let's continue. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his witness. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without measure. Notice that the Word and the Spirit are together here in this same verse. And a lot of people would say, oh, you know, I'm, I go by the Spirit. I don't, go, I don't go by the Scriptures. Listen, the Scriptures are, you know, every time it says, thus saith the Lord, that is the words of the Spirit. If your so-called Spirit is different than the Scripture, then you have a different Spirit. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. One who believes in the Son has eternal life, but one who disobeys, disobeys here, or also in some translations, disbelieves the Son, won't see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God remains on him. Now, in the old King James Version, you say the wrath of God abides on him, lives on him. Oh, well, you see, isn't that much different than John 3.16? John 3.16 talking about how much God so loved the world. And John 3.17, how God doesn't come to judge anybody but to save. Listen, you need to take it in context. If you disobey, the wrath of God will live on you. Can you imagine how much terror, how much horror that would be when the wrath of God lives on somebody? I pray that everybody that listens to this, to this teaching, I hear that everybody within the sound of my voice, I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice is not one of those people on whom the wrath of God lives. Now, if you disobey Jesus, the wrath of God lives on you. So you must have the fear of God. You must seek the fear of God because when, when Jesus speaks, you must say, oh, wow, I need to really make sure, make sure I'm obeying this command in all areas of my life. Now, don't forget that Jesus was a rabbi. 
Don't forget that everything that Jesus taught came from the so-called Old Testament. Jesus didn't bring anything new. He rather just opened up and expounded upon what that which was already there. Okay? So as you go, may God bless you and give you great revelation into all these things, into the Word of God, and may your experience in walking with the Lord be that of great excitement and great joy. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.